All aware, the exhibits will be open today uh, from 11.15. Uh, we transition from lunch today uh, into the exhibit hall for dessert. Um, just to pro provide you with that little bit of extra incentive to go visit our sponsors. Uh, lunch will be back on the uh, lawn today. Obviously, it's a much uh, better weather day. Uh, there's a very good chance that tomorrow, however, we'll need to bring lunch back inside. So. Uh, please watch the app and the notice board uh, for those announcements, but it looks, pr I think, the predicting 90% chance of rain there. Uh, because of that, we're also moving uh, Len Silverstone's Thursday workshop on understanding uh, human behavioral factors from the Bahia Bell, which is the smaller of the two boats, into the cockatoo room, uh, which is one of these uh, aviary rooms on this level. Uh, that'll just obviously reduce the number of people who have to possibly walk in the rain. Um, uh, okay, at the registration desk, you'll find some pink evaluation forms for the conference. Um, I know this seems really old school to get you to fill this out by hand, but uh, we've done electronically and we get like a small fraction of the number of responses and the quality is not nearly as good. So uh, we still make this available and to give you an incentive to uh, do that, um, we do a drawing at the end of the conference. Uh, one person gets an all-expense-paid trip back to DGIQ uh, in June next year or to the December event, if you prefer to do that. Uh, and to enhance the attractiveness of this opportunity this time, uh, we're also going to add five complimentary uh, tickets to Enterprise Data World in March next year. Those will not be all expenses paid, but we will be waiving all your registration fees. So if you're someone who likes to give their opinion, uh, doesn't mind spending a few minutes on that, uh, we're, we're giving you an incentive to, to do that. Um, for those of you who were kind enough to fill out the tutorial evaluations uh, from earlier this week, uh, we have four books to give away. Actually, I gave away two of them for another purpose, so I'm going to have to buy them from Amazon to send you. But um, Valerie uh, Boventre from Bloomberg, um, uh, Nikki Mead of Alliance Data, uh, Daniel Callender, uh, Callenden from Ball Aerospace, and Duran Hook from One America. Uh, we have two books to give away. One was the Agile Data Governance book by Laura Madsen. Uh, the other is Danette McGilvray's Executing Data Quality Projects. Uh, so uh, I'm going to leave these at the registration desk. Or it, it, uh, any of those folks whose names I read out, are you in the room right now? Oh, you're right in front of me. OK. Um, and Danette sitting right next to you. It did. OK. <laughs> Do you have this book already? Okay, uh, she might even sign that for you. <laughs> uh, somebody else whose name I read out? Okay, uh, you can ask Danette to sign your copy as well. And I'm, I'm sorry I'm not making my way through there, but I don't want to put my mask back on. All right, so we're gonna jump into our keynote now. Um, can we bring Anthony <coughs> and April up? So we have uh, five panelists. Two of whom are remote, obviously, and three are live and in person. From your right to left, our moderator, Anthony Algman. Uh, Anthony wrote the first book that Data Diversity ever published on data leadership. Very animated uh, speaker. We love having Anthony with us. He's uh, served so many roles from chief data officer uh, through to data governance consultant and at this point is doing amazing work uh, in a big pharma organization. However, uh, for his official conference designation, he, he still uses his, um, his consulting firm. Uh, April is also actually in pharma now, but April has been uh, uh, in just so many uh, roles of data governance and data architecture over many years. Um, at a variety of, of customer organizations. So she's currently with um, BMS. All right, working down the list from your right to left. Then we have uh, Matt Crittenden from IBM. I'll ask Matt to give his own bio, to have 15 seconds worth of his own bio. Really quickly, I'm an old guy, started in the 80s in data integration, the 90s on ERP, and the last, uh, the last two decades in governance and quality. Okay. Uh, then we have Sherrod Vashni from Overledge, uh, CEO of Overledge. Sherrod? Yeah, so I'm Sherrod Varshney, CEO of Overledge. 
and uh, I am probably coming from ERP background, move into data warehousing, and then move to data uh, governance. So we, I built, I went to the data governance space really to build the product to start with. So this kind of like, um, it's been about uh, six, seven years we are in the data governance space, and we are kind of like uh, building the ground up product from that. Terrific. So. And last but far from least, uh, Tim Musgrove uh, from Callisto Media. I've known Tim for many years. Uh, he's perhaps the most technically oriented in his current role uh, of any of our panelists, but uh, Callisto is doing some amazing things, and uh, Tim is in particular a, a natural language guy. Uh, uh, what did I leave out there, Tim, that you'd like everybody to know about? Uh, that's pretty much it, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what I, the other thing I will say is uh, one of my favorite talks at, at the conference was the one that uh, he and his colleague Zawad did yesterday on incorporating project management into the data governance uh, program. So uh, next time we get Tim back, you got to see that talk. All right. Anthony, uh, I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, Anthony came to me with this particular topic about uh, data governance tooling, um, so I think he's the best person to introduce the topic. Thanks. Thank you, Tony, and uh, I am very sad to not be in the room with you all this week, but I am very excited to be uh, given the opportunity to talk about this topic. So, you know, I, I spent a fair amount of time at DGIQ events, and I spent a lot of time in the industry, and I would imagine that most of you in the audience are kind of Sorry. the opinion that you know, we probably shouldn't put the future of our data governments in the hands of the tools, where we should rely on these tools to make us successful with data governance. <coughs> Yet I also imagine many of you in the audience, or all of you in the audience very likely, have witnessed a tools first approach to solving big problems in our businesses. Where we say, hey, let's buy that shiny object, it will solve all of our complicated problems. So if we ignore that entirely, we're probably going to be less relevant to some of those folks that are making those decisions than we might otherwise be. So what we want to be thinking about in the, in the context of this panel, and why I kind of pitched this to Tony and why I'm interested, kind of twofold. One, let's not forget there's tools out there that can help us in our data governance journey. And two, I don't like our tools that are out there to help us in our data governance journey, and I think we can get better than we have. And so what I want us to think about today is what are we going to be using in terms of tools? What do we have in, in terms of what's supplementing our people, which is probably what you focused on in a lot of the, the um, sessions that you've been through this week. But what is it about tools that may not be meeting what we need in the future, if I need from them today? And so let's spend a little bit of time talking about just this. And so I will start uh, with um, my colleague on the phone, April, to talk a little bit first, and, and why don't we each spend 30 seconds, I've already done mine more than that, on what we assess the role of um, tools and, and what they do today in terms of what role do data governance tools play in successful data governance today? So, thanks, Anthony. Um, so, I, am, I work for Bristol Myers Squibb. And um, I've worked as both, you know, for corporations and as a con contractor consultant, um, setting up data governance capabilities at, at different organizations. And the what you the the struggle with the data governance tools um, I find is that that we we run into you know there just isn't enough time or resources to hand curate the metadata about the data we're trying to manage okay and so we want to automate that we want to automatically collect metadata that we can use to search and find and and manage our the data in the organization the problem is that the automated metadata collection is too technical. Um, it's just, it tends to just kind of be a bunch of little metadata 
pieces of information that have no perspective and no link and no and, and so the struggle is to try to balance having a uh, description meaning metadata that means something to people um, and is usable with being able to automate this and how do you and how do you strike the right balance i mean you'd like it to be fully automated but I, you know, I've seen a lot of failures trying to do that, right? You, you know, on the other hand, you, you, there's, there's no way you can fully manually collect this information. So we kind of want to do better in the automation, I think, um, and, and, and balancing how to achieve creating a, a catalog, an inventory of data that's usable to manage our inventories. Great. Why don't we go on the same order Tony did. Uh, Matt, why don't we start with you and go right to left across the stage? Okay. Um, tied to that, the automation can do a lot of good for you. It can speed up the process of collecting that information. The problem, as we've already discussed, is the fact of you get a lot of garbage. I just, um, we're, my company's releasing some new software, not here to talk about that, but we just went through a bunch of pilots with a, with a series of customers and one customer in, during their pilot brought in 29,000 data tables. Zero terminology, policies, the things that would tie to that. Another customer did the exact opposite, brought in 15, 16,000 business terms, no data objects. So they're focusing on little minuscule parts of it. Technology is not going to help you on that. You know, we all know the holy trinity of governance, right? People process technology, or if you follow uh, a forest or people process platform product, um, you've got to balance that. You know, it, it's not technology at at the most is thirty percent of the story, and you if you don't have those other two things, you're going to be spending a lot of time with technology, gathering information you're never ever going to use. But, Shred. Yeah. So I think this is not a complex, in my opinion. You first do the automation, you bring crawl all the data, you bring into the repository. Then after that, you go with the community and figure it out what, the, what it's needed, right? So the problem comes up here is adoption. Not many people are ready to put the tribal knowledge into it. This is where the sophistication of tools comes in, right? So imagine uh, 10 years back, nobody was on TikTok, nobody was on Facebook. You know, everybody used to call everybody, and then the sophistication of the technology came up, uh, the TikTok, people don't have to do anything, they just keep watching and keep watching, and then, you know, they are like in getting entertained. At the meantime, they're also generating some data. So if the tools are sophisticated enough, and they can provide you the ability so that users can very intellig intelligently give their inf information to the tool, that's where the tools, the future of the tool is, and this is where um, how you need to leverage your audience or your users to kind of give, give this information to you. Uh, if you keep it just, oh, we just put out the tribal knowledge into the tool, it's not going to work. You have to have some rewards, and then you need to have a governance on top of that. So other than the lot of the garbage in comes from the users as well. You get the length of state definition, and you will get just different definitions, but they they do not go to the detail. In order to go to the detail, you really need to go and figure it out a methodology that how would you go into detail. So it's a, as you say, that there's a people, people is needed definitely, but also the process to collect this information is important. And that's where the, the, the data governance team and you guys are important to create and establish this process of collecting the metadata from user being. The automation is very simple. You just connect and crawl it. The only thing is that you are trying to, most of the time, organization, they want to grab everything, millions of objects at one time, and they have no way to collect the metadata information from other. So focus on one department, one domain, collect the metadata from there, and then trying to get the value from others. Then things is going to work pretty well. That's what we have seen. Excellent. Tim, do you have a reaction to that? Yeah, I think there's so many problems. Uh, what are you going to shake a stick at? But I'll, I'll go back to the first thing you said about you're, 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 you're onto something about 
people having a tendency to take a, a tools first approach. Um, you know what, if we would be literal about it, I don't mind people having the very idea of a tools first approach. I like it that they, they want to think of trying to use a tool to do things at scale on an automated basis. Part of that's I'm in a really big data company. If we can't do something at scale, then forget about it. But I think, I think the problem is the way that they go tools first. Um, so if it's just stumbling into the first tool they see a demo of and they haven't really vetted it, they haven't looked at the whole range of offerings on the market, and that happens all the time in lots of organizations. Uh, if they don't talk to anyone else in the organization, uh, you have somebody in this department not realizing that they're acquiring a tool and paying money for it when someone else in another department already bought a tool last year that kind of does the same thing. And so, and it's how you organize the tools. I, I have to confess that, you know, my garage at my house is not one of those where the guy has the pegboards all labeled with the hooks and all the tools. It's kind of a mess. And I've, I've done that do-it-yourself home project where I can't find that tool. I know I have it. And I fall into temptation. I run to Home Depot and I buy another one, even knowing I already probably have three, you know? <laughs> and they're in this mass. And so that's what it looks like in our company with the software tools, right? So it's, it's, not, that, it's not that trying to use tools as your first idea of how you're going to scale something forward is a bad idea in itself. It's the people's misbehavior about acquiring tools in a messy way and storing and, you know, sort of maintaining and nurturing the tools in a messy way. Yeah, well, it, it, to build on that, the, the kind of tool proliferation, too, is like, it may not be the exact same tool that you already know you have, but it can be this other tool that has this new feature, and that's going to be the thing that solves this problem for us this time, right? And then, and so you just end up with all these different tools. And, and like, like Tony mentioned in my bio, I work for a large pharmaceutical organization now, and we have all the tools, it seems. Like, it's just, the problem becomes, how do we use them in an effective, coordinated way? And I wanna mention too, something that Sherrod said really made me smile, is that whole notion of, we used to call people on the phone, and, and now, we're using TikTok, we're using other message, you know, messaging apps or other email or whatever to connect with each other. But I think about when my phone rings, I'm almost never going to answer it anymore unless <laughs> it's my wife or Tony Shaw. And like, I'm just <laughs> I pick up the phone. Everybody else, um, yeah, it'll, it'll go to voicemail and, and I'll get to it eventually. But um, so, but I want to think as we as we think about these tools, right? We we know there's some potential here, and I think you all know, uh, kind of articulated that very well. There's potential in these tools. There's benefit in these tools. We have seen progress, and I think that's an important statement to make that I kind of neglected early on. But we know one thing is true. We are going to buy more tools. There's going to be more tools. Even like Tim, to your point. Even if we know we probably don't need another tool, we're getting another tool sometime here. So, as we look at the audience, as we think about uh, the folks here at DGIQ that are influencing or making purchase decisions on these kinds of governance tools, what advice do we have for how to go about doing that and buying and investing in tools that will lead to the most benefit? And then after this, we'll kind of start talking about more features of tools. Let's talk broadly. Data governance tools, how best to approach this kind of thing? And I'll ask Tony uh, to help. This is volunteer basis. If you have something to say on the panel, um, you know, please, uh, please chime in. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, as you're going through this, when I'm, when I'm out with a client and we're talking about you know, what they're doing, they'll immediately ask me, okay, well, show me your software. And I, I never go there. We, we have to have a conversation about what you're trying to do in your governance program. What type of quality problems you're facing? Why did you even bring me in here? And I, I, I always make sure that I have this conversation before I go on site so that we can actually talk about things that are relative to this. I strongly encourage anybody getting started looking at software to make a list of your priorities that you're trying to approach. What, what is priority one, two, three, four, all the way out? We always talk, you know, start small and work your way up. Start with a line of business and go to the enterprise, you know, however you want to do it. But come up with that list of things so that when you bring in any of us that are in the, in the room over there, that you're bringing the right person to the table that can actually meet your needs today going on down the road. 
Um, there's, there's nothing worse than somebody coming in and showing you a new pretty object that won't satisfy your second or third project. You know, and, and we've got lots of different technologies there that'll help in governance pro projects. You need to make sure that you're getting the right one that'll satisfy your needs versus somebody else in the room. Yeah, I will extend that further. So what is happening is that people are focusing too much on the problem right now they have it, and they look for the tool which is solving the problem which is existing. So why do you get it up as the tile, you know, the silos of tool which do not integrate with each other? So you need to look at the comprehensive strategy, not only right now, but maybe two or three years down the line, that how you are going to use your entire enterprise architecture and what is your big data strategy, what is your business strategy, how the data strategy is meeting with the business strategy. Understand that and then sell as well within the organization because I can guarantee, right, maybe a lot of people you do not have a proper business, proper business use case for your data. So you're just creating a data platform. Once you create that, and you need to understand the problem you're going to happen one year down the line and two years down the line as well, you need to know the list of those. If you don't have it, hire consultant, hire people from this group, and there are a lot of people, smart people here, who will tell you these are the problems you're going to face. Then make your list existing problem right now, what is the future problem, and then look for the tool, which is kind of like comprehensive. Otherwise, you will get the silos of tools, and there's too many tools, and then you will not be able to integrate all these tools together. And that is another problem you're going to face. So that's the little two cents I have it. Isn't that a big corporate culture change for some organizations, though? I mean, I, I don't know how many people here, you, you're in an organization where almost all the employees can only think one quarter in advance because that's how they're judged and incentivized. And you know, part of it's if you're a public company, I've been in both private and public, I'm in a pre-IPO company right now, and I can just feel as we get close to going public, this, this time horizon shrinking down to more short term. And people can only solve a problem that's this quarter, the current quarter or the next quarter. And to do what folks like us want to do, you've got to get this like three to five year time horizon in, in, in front of people's minds. But do the rest of you face that? Or how do you get, how do you get your, your, your stakeholders to think of data governance as, as a long term thing instead of just fixing the immediate pain point? So I. The, the struggle that I see with data governance um, a lot, it, it's, it's kind of the opposite of some of the other issues we have. Everybody knows what data governance is, except almost nobody's definition of data governance matches like a, a standard definition, right, of, of somebody who works in data governance, what their definition of data governance is. So, um, you know, and everyone, you know, sort of whatever problem you have, um, the answer is always, oh, well, if we had a data governance program, that would, that would solve that problem. Um, so we, you know, we start with, well, what is the problem that the organization is actually trying to solve um, that they're calling data governance? And, um, it, and, and what, that, what that really means to the organization, may depend on the driver that that's that's causing this to be to, to come up you know maybe there's a compliance uh, requirement that that uh, that you need to meet or um, or there's some sort of data quality problem or um, or you know you're trying to improve your the maturity of your data management hopefully um, but but then then very few people who haven't done it actually knows what data governance looks like when it's walking around, right? They may, they may know what, you know, potentially um, how to start, right? Um, but, when, but what's the target that you're trying to get to? So, and the answers to those questions, as, as you know, what the, the panel said, um, really changes what the tools are that you're going to need and, um, and, and, and how you're going to use them. So I frequently, you know, it's like start with Excel. Excel and, and SharePoint, right? Like start there in terms of tools. 
and then understand what you're actually trying to do so that you know if you do go out and buy a tool um, and and there's also some other kind of you know beginner very very uh, inexpensive tools that may be a, a, a closer to to actually data governance tools but then um, you know if you're going to go out and buy a tool and and make an investment um, having more of a of a plan about what that means right because I think we've all seen uh, where organizations will buy a tool and then won't do anything with it and it'll just sit there um, because there was no project to actually do anything with it. So I want to make sure we have some time to talk about the specifics of the tools that are available to us. So when I think data governance tools, I think in like a central core, I think of a data catalog plus some sort of workflow management routing type of thing. That's my core of data governance. And then on the periphery, I see things like data quality tools and master data stuff, and you've got you know, other kinds of data repositories. You think about how we're operating on data or metadata. We talk about some of that stuff as well. But A, I'm curious whether the other panelists think of data governance tools when used in that kind of terminology fits. And then second, is this the best we can do? Like, is this enough or are we missing something fundamental or does the future just hold better data catalog, better workflow management, or is there something that will transform how we do data governance with the tooling um, uh, the, that is to come? So what do you guys think? I can start. So what I see, the, um, the first part is that, you know, the, what technology can do. Technology can at this point of time, at the current point of time, it can figure out, it can crawl the metadata. So what we're talking about, the data catalog, it needs to be able to crawl all the metadata. It should be able to figure out the lineage, which is technical lineage, where the data come from, where it goes, right? That's, that's the technology can do it. It can uh, figure out just the profiling information, you know, what exactly it should be. So it's, uh, you know, statistics about the data. It should be able to support as many data sources you have so that it can kind of crawl the data. So that's the data cataloging aspect of that. That's the basic minimum you need in order to move further. Then you need a capability in different dimensions to improve the quality of the data, to improve the literacy of the data, to improve the quality of the metadata. And then the third thing is needed is the access. You know, Who can have access to what information? So I generally have are uh, three ways of looking at it. One is the literacy, which is like enhancing the quality of the metadata. Another one is the quality, which is enhancing the quality of the data itself. And the third one is access, which is who should have access. And the privacy compliance comes under access because that need to do it. Plus you also need a classification because you should be able to protect the data. So you need a AI capabilities or some sort of a, you know, uh, some capability so that you can figure it out, which is the PII, which is a PHI, and how to control it, who is the confidential information. So you need that kind of information. And then most importantly, you need tools and algorithms to find the processes to kind of improve your workflows. So whatever the workflow you create, people are not going to respond to that. That's human behavior, right? Until unless you create something like TikTok, you know? So how, what are the different adoption tools you have in your chest, kind of tool chest, which can keep improving this system, right? So that's the most importantly adoption. And adoption is the layer which you need to think very creatively in that areas. You know, if the sometime adoption is embedding within the existing tools. Maybe you build the business glossary phenomenally, spend so much time, but nobody's using into it, right? What if you plug in that business glossary with the reports people are consuming those? Now suddenly you see, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the report and then I'm looking at the beta, and I exactly see that what is the definition of a beta is. And what is this report a beta definition versus maybe some other reports, right? Abita is a very finalized term, everybody understand that, but not length of stay in hospital, right? So that's a different kind of uh, like terminology which you need to understand that. So 
And then there is a operational aspect of that is also there some of the time, that what are the tools you're supporting in the various aspect of operationalization of those. So those are the typical I see at the high level you need capabilities in this area of data cap governance suit. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar in that I see the data catalog as one of the foundational tools, but I look at what comes after that a little bit differently. Maybe it's because I've worked with content and media publishing kind of organizations a lot. So for us, one of the, one of the very next things actually is the metadata tools um, and, and very rich because if we can't handle just immense amounts of content and understand how they interrelate, then we don't win. And so metadata tools for us is very rich. Um, it means that we even use things like Cognitum as an ontology tool, um, taxonomy tools. We have to be able to collapse and view trees of taxonomies really, really well and, and use that as a way of normalizing thousands and thousands and thousands of tags. Um, and like you said earlier, you can't do all this manually. Um, so we need to also invoke um, AI to help us normalize the, the, the system of, of tags. And that's just really foundational for us. But taking a step back, there are, there are tools that should precede data governance that you should be able to take for granted. And yet, in a lot of organizations, you can't. Like, data modeling should have already been done just by any company that has set up a database at all, right? Where you should have conceptual and logical and physical models of, of the data models, and you should be able to hold those up and visualize them right next to your business process diagrams and see that they match. Like, even, even companies that haven't done data governance should have done that just by virtue of being responsible people setting up a database. And yet it's very common that organizations have become completely dependent on databases without proper data modeling. So sometimes you have to back up a step and, and, and clean house there first with, those, with, those, with the data modeling tools of the organization. I just want to add one other uh, concept here. How many in the room have heard the uh, concept of a data fabric? Awesome. To me, that is one of the central things. In fact, we're going to actually be doing a presentation, not technology oriented, but a, a presentation about data fabrics later today. And the point I'm bringing up about that was that everything that we're talking about in the data space, whether it be your data governance things, your data quality components, your <coughs> integration, your master data, reference data, this all needs to tie together so that you can actually get the true value out of this. You don't want to buy technology to do these niche things unless they can do the niche things and tie to each other. You know, so if you buy a, a, a catalog solution, making sure that catalog solution works with your integration tools or works with your BI tools or works with your data science organization. Because your data is used everywhere in your organization, your enterprise. And, you know, and we can define you know, the organization, whether it be a line of business, a geography, the entire or your company for some of the really large companies. Without having a concept of a fabric where your technologies talk to all your data ops work, your, your governance work that you're doing, it's really a waste of time. You need to make sure that this all works in harmony or you're just spending a lot of money on technology that's going to fill, fill a little niche for a very short period of time. So. Yeah, if I can jump back in there just a second. One of the eye-openers I have had from being at this conference is I didn't realize how lucky I am to be the CTO and be in charge of data governance because I have total veto power over any third-party tools anybody in the company buys. And I have software engineers at my command. Um, so, I can, so I can make the plugins. I, I, I'm in, it's my fault if we don't do the integrations correctly with the APIs. Um, I can write my own ETLs with my team if I, um, if I want. And at this point, I would be scared of taking on data governance in any company if I didn't have veto power over third-party tool adoption. <laughs> I, I, would, I, would, I would be scared. I think that you need to have a big, a big say in that. I think if you can't, maybe it's because I've been in companies with bad habits. But I think if you, if, you can't, if, if you can't have a big say in the selection and the setup of the tools, you can't ever, you can't ever tame that wild horse. I just I want to add to that, since you just mentioned that I, I was with a client, it was probably about two years ago, right before the pandemic, and one of their, it's a compilation of a lot of big companies. One of the companies used one catalog solution, another one used another one, another one used a third. I came in, then they brought each of the vendors in to show why their solution was the best. 
And instead, we flipped the conversation and we talked about what they were really trying to do. It's not whose technology is the best, it's whose technology solves the problem that you have. Mm. And b being able to have that veto problem because I, it's just, there's nothing scarier than seeing a, a small group, a niche of the business, buying something that doesn't tie to everything else. You need to make sure that your, your, your stuff works together in harmony so you're just not wasting time and money. But That's a great point, Matt. And, and like, there is no shortage of poorly used great technology out there, right? Like that is something yeah. that yeah. we can yeah. see all of the time. And I want to ask, because Tim's comment around having this ability, and I think you're probably in the vast minority of people <laughs> that get to do data governance and also have direct line of sight to the technology uh, program. I don't think that's the norm. So I want to flip that situation around 180 degrees, because what I think is, is more prevalent, at least from my uh, experience and vantage point, is people trying to do data governance that sit outside the IT organization, driving this from the business, and the IT organization isn't receptive to what is, is trying to be done, and, and, or at least isn't excited and as collaborative about that as we might want them to be. What do we do if they, and then the IT organization who inevitably carries a lot of weight with the technology and tools, what do we do as a business-centric data governance person trying to influence a technology organization that may not be as receptive as we would like them to be with data governance? So uh, I will take that. I think there is a, um, I have seen in our customer base at least half-half. The half of the time people buy, the IT people is buying the data governance product and half of the people at the business side is buying it. And, and, and sometimes the compliance is also buying as well. So I think there is a compliance, IT, and business, all three need to be on the table in order to make data governance successful. If, they both are, if all three are not on the table, there is a, some sort of a lag you're going to see in order to implementation. I have seen IT projects, IT-driven data governance, miserably fail because there's no business stakeholder. So there's nobody taking from the business side. And I see from the business side, um, I see April might be from the business side, that she's saying, oh, we are having a hard time collecting the data and then getting the metadata out because there's no IT person is actually involved in that process. So the business person is trying to do it. They don't know what the drivers are supposed to use. And that's why you are having problem. So the business, IT, and if possible, compliance. If all three together meet and to start the data governance program, you have, a, you have a guaranteed win in that. Yes, yeah, since you just mentioned that, I, I apologize for jumping in here, but I just went through with a really, really large telecommunications company where we went through a massive PC led by, or POC rather, led by the IT. And we jumped through every possible hoop and showed exactly how the technology would satisfy IT. In our final presentations to the line of business, they said absolutely not because that's not solving what our problem really is. Our technology was the best in the market for what IT wanted, but the line of business said, no, you have to have everybody at the table. You don't want to make them, you don't want to waste your time. No, none of us want to waste time anymore. So, you know, making sure you get all three parts of the organization, you know, if, if you separate compliance from governance, having everybody together. So, when I was consulting and, and setting up data governance programs for, at, as an employee of a consulting organization, um, I kept lucking out because I would get on projects that were driven from the business side. So they were, they were uh, business driven data governance programs that they wanted to set up. And, you know, we were almost always successful, whereas the data governance programs that were driven from the IT side were almost always not. Um, and it wasn't me that made the difference per se. I think it's. I think that that you really need the the drive to be coming from from the business perspective. Um, by the way, I've always been in IT, so I'm I'm, I'm an IT person. Um, but uh, but for data governance success, um, I've seen that it requires a, a business driven program to be successful. So, you know, if it, if it can't be joint, right, then, then I think that you need that, that business driver um, to, be, to have a successful program. 
That's great. So in the interest of time, so the last main question before hopefully we'll have a couple minutes for, for audience questions, but I, I, there's a question I love to ask, and, and I asked my tutorial earlier this week uh, this question, and, and I think to preface it, there's a general awareness, and I would imagine some nodding heads in the room, that we would say data governance is difficult under the best circumstances. It's complex under the best circumstances. We'll take that as truth for the context of this question. So the question I ask my tutorial in a lot of the classes, which leads to a little bit of a, a, an uncomfortable response, is what does wildly successful data governance look like? And so that's the question I ask them. And that can be difficult to answer. But I'm gonna ask you guys, this is a keynote panel, you guys get the 400 level question, which is, what does wildly successful data governance look like in 2026 or 2027, say five years from now, and how does that differ from today? We, we don't do strategies at the five-year level anymore, Anthony. We, <laughs> we do three-year strategies. How long does it take to implement tools in your company? Because... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, what does is, what is successful look like? I, I'm not sure that successful is going to look uh, particularly different right, in the future than it does right now. Success means um, you, can, you can find the data and you can get access to it in very short periods of time. Appropriate access, by the way. So let me take that. Um, so I consider data governance as a defense, while data science, data engineering is offense of any, any strategy, right? So the defense in the sense that, like, uh, of course, you need both pillar of, of any game what we are playing here. So the data governance, the defense is good. That means that most of the time, if the ball is in the offense side, this is a good idea, right? If the ball is in defense side all the time, then you don't want that to happen, right? So in order to, the successful data governance program is actually should feel like that there is nothing is happening there. The most of the time, the offense is working all the time. But as, as uh, April said that, that nice successful data governance program is paint a picture, you go to the Google, you search the data, okay, I need my customer information, you get it, that information right away, and it has some PHI information, it also has some uh, you know, information, and then you realize though, okay, I have all the customer data, but there's a social security number as well, there's a salary information of employees as well, but I need approval to see the social security number, I create, I put the button and the proper access management because I'm not aligned to see it. I got the permission, I got it. And, and then I was able to get the data, but I was not allowed to get the salary data, that's fine. I was able to query the data and then we were able to do it. This whole part of the management aspect of this has been done and taken care of it. When I say customer, this actually is a customer. When I say employee, this actually is an employee. There is only one customer information. There is only one employee information. There are not 50 different employee information. And even in the, my company right now, if I, if I have three systems, the three systems will show different employee count, which is a pure information. I forget about IBM. Like, I don't think they can even count the number of employees they have. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can. Like, 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 so, so, and this is a, a true, like, you know, the, forget about the number of customers because that's in too many places. Like, just the employee count is difficult. So that's how what the successful data governance program should be, and it's not that difficult to even even do it now. But the most of the time, what I see is that organization is focusing too much on the on the actually to do hows to do it. Right, really going to the details, but sometimes the people are either focused at the top level, and sometimes people are focused at the bottom level. There is a comprehensive approach of achieving this. You require from the top to bottom approach. The so people should know, and the strategy should also know how to implement it. Right. So that's where is the, is the missing gap. I feel personally that in, in most of the time, people I have seen a lot of experienced people here, but they it seems like they are talking at the very top level. But there is detail is missing sometimes. But when you have the detail people, then there is strategy is missing. So if you combine a strategy through the detail, then you have a successful winning formula. That's personally I feel. I, I, I want to jump in here. This is one of those cases where I have like a, a very clear, strong opinion on this. 
Um, I, I think I, I'm really clear about what I think is the litmus test, how you can tell if you're having really successful data governance. And it's where the word shows up. It's where you notice the word sharing up, uh, showing up. And I can give you really concrete examples. When you're having meetings, if you start noticing meetings in the company, and the meetings are not data governance meetings per se, and you're hearing the word data governance come out of the mouths of people in those meetings who are not data stewards or not officially part of the data governance program, you're seeing that it's become a common vocabulary word across the vernacular of your organization. You're having really, really good success. Other places where the word should show up, if you have, and you should have, a universal company onboarding, like every new employee first day on the job, maybe first two days goes through hours of what, isn't mentioned in there. Is it mentioned, how many times is it mentioned? It's, it should be mentioned like a few times, beginning, middle, and end of the onboarding process. Not because you forced it, but because the marketing department wouldn't even think of doing their 30 minute section of the onboarding without mentioning data governance somewhere. When you see it showing up like that, the other thing is in employee evaluations. Once a year or twice a year, you probably have a standard template tool for all the employees to be, be reviewed. This is whether they're gonna get a promotion or not. Are they, other than the data governance program staff, is data governance mentioned in the, in the, in the templated questions that the managers are setting up by which they're gonna review all their employees across most of the organization? You can check how widely dispersed this word is coming up. And when it's coming up in all those places, you have a dynamite you know, data governance program. I just wanna leave you with nine words from my perspective. Your governance program is successful if you know your data, you can trust the data, and you can use your data. Real simple. It's all about the data, knowing where it's at, can you actually trust the quality of it, and are your consumers of that data satisfied? So, nine words. So in, in the interest of time, I think this is a great place to close. I, I just want to thank all the panelists. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all of the folks attending. Um, hopefully you learned something today. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be part of this. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you.